types of lack of equivalence. It is about terminological difference in theory of translation because um, all, uh, some terms can be named uh, differently and uh, scientists uh, use it, um, use them how they see them and to, to uh, see all the terms used in theory of translation is almost impossible. Um, and the key moments uh, and realities and uh, ethno language uh, lexis, um, they are all constitute uh, lexis with lack of equivalence. And um, there is uh, no uh, clear definition of these terms in the modern world. Unfortunately, I guess, well, maybe I'm not right, but still uh, realities are defined as lacunes, uh, language lacunas, and uh, folklore um, words. So there is no terminology um, generality. So I can't but agree with you that there are no clear definitions and I guess that we will have some commentaries and uh, questions uh, in this um, in this respect. Uh, we need clear criteria and I uh, I agree with you in the topology or because it is important for typology of uh, translation pro errors, it is important for us as English professors and we will discuss this problem. Do you have any uh, questions? If no, then we uh, go to another, uh, uh, another um, speaker, uh, Nadezhda, Nadezhda Rebtseva. She's absent, yeah? Well, okay, she's absent. Then we will uh, hear the report of um, Yelena Bugreva. Uh, we will um, discuss modern situation um, related to pandemic and the Lexis related to COVID-19 pandemic, the neologisms, new words, new lexis of Russian, English, German, um, all the languages reacted. And now we will hear uh, two talks on um, Russian and English and German and Russian. Uh, this uh, topic is very pressing is very up to date. We will have something to discuss. So, Ms. Bugreva, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. It is a great honor to attend such, um, such an event in such a place. So, uh, I love participating in different conferences and seminars, conducting them. Thank you for inviting me. It's uh, very, uh, I'm very grateful to you. Uh, my talk uh, would be um, very illustrative. So let me show you some slides with examples. Uh, do you see them? Yeah. Yeah, 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 we see them. So everybody knows language is always a mirror of the changes of the um, society and of people's life and pandemic is no exception and lots of languages uh, created new words, um, actualized uh, some meanings, for example, some medical terms are now 
um, more relevant and there are new meanings, the isolation, the pandemic, social distancing, and these word and word combinations gained new understanding and new meaning. These processes aren't to be worried about uh, on the conference in the uh, MSU. Uh, Mr. Crystal said that there is no I need to worry. These uh, words came with this new era and uh, Mr. Korongao said that some of these words would disappear sometimes. So um, on this slide, there are main words of uh, this uh, year. This is uh, the world's safe isolation. Merriam-Webster named pandemic and current time, lockdown. There is also an abbreviation and Oxford Dictionary uh, created a report. Here you can see the link. Um, you would, th there are some words. So a Russian language uh, is very rich and uh, words creation is also very rich. Uh, so see these two um, examples from COVID and Corona, and there are lots of words, some game words. So in English, you can also see other neologisms. I won't read them from the slides. I don't like reading from slides. So you can see everything with your own eyes. It is some um, some part of new words, some uh, words have gained new meaning. I um, sampled some uh, 60 words from the internet uh, for my research to analyze how to translate them and uh, translate them orally and in written form, how to understand these lexis. There is a tendency in English and English uh, mirrored everyday routine. So um, people gained the weight uh, of uh, hyperdynamy and so this cut the people who made themselves I went to a clandestine um, hairdressers and um, the Russian language has um, some like game words. Кому нужна это наружа о карантине to to walk with the dogs and some. Uh, getting rid of uh, things you don't need to and um, quarantine vacations currently uh, there is no um, routine words uh, but they also reflect all the uh, also reflect uh, this new reality there were some memes uh, about uh, this porridge called Grechka and a quarantine uh, tale, Udalionushka Ivratits Divanushka. I wouldn't risk translating it into English because it is a very difficult uh, thing to translate. Um, I would like to research the methods of translating from English into Russian and from Russian into English. Well, I didn't uh, manage to. Um, limit by seven pages. That is why I had to shorten my research. So uh, from these 60 words, uh, there are um, uh, some examples I uh, chose. There is my translation, for example, Corona Rita. It is Margarita. Uh, it is a cocktail. Well, I haven't uh, tasted it yet. It can be um, translated with uh, transliteration or transcription. Uh, 
well, uh, it's a happy hour. It is written on shops. It is a word combination which gained new meaning. So uh, everyone had a few too many coronaritas during our Zoom happy hour. Uh, luckily, the commute wasn't far. Um, or, for example, uh, Zoom mallet. Uh, Zoom mallet. Well, and what is mallet? It is a hairstyle in in front of a camera. It is built all business in the front, all party in the back. Uh, see what I found in the internet. So Zoom Mallet is uh, not also a, a haircut. It is also the clothes business on the top, party on the bottom, some like pajama pants. Um, these transformations come from everyday life. Every day, uh, do you have two minutes. Yeah. Um, continue. So, see. Other examples uh, of transcription and transliteration, coronation, uh, it is um, a copy, uh, well, Zoom town, Zoom город, and new trends, and some uh, Aunt Rona, like Aunt Corona, and the most complicated group is metaphors, blurs day. Uh, it is like uh, a day which uh, repeats. And then Corona Coaster, the, the phases. Doom scrolling is doom scrolling and also an explication and transcription. And uh, quarantine. Uh, and how to translate it is, is some slang and people uh, wrote incorrect uh, pen dating, eyeling, when you do not see a mouth, current uh, asylum. Um, and there are other words, uh, zoom fatigue. Uh, it is um, translated by description. So there are three. Uh, groups of uh, transformations, uh, transcription, transliteration, uh, calcin, and uh, the description or explication where uh, you should uh, reflect the theme and the form of the word and the prospects. I uh, I see some prospects creating a, a two-way. Uh, dictionary of this uh, pandemic lexis and um, the study of Russian new lexis units uh, into English. Uh, I guess it would be very complicated and almost impossible. Thank you, dear colleagues. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Questions, colleagues? Okay, if you have no questions, uh, so everything was very clear and uh, uh, people uh, are thinking so well, maybe later. Uh, well, I'm like a very modest translator. Uh, thank you, Ms. Bugreva. I guess there will be uh, questions later, so people liked the talk, I guess. Uh, uh, now we would move uh, to uh, Ms. Uh, Kashankova. Uh, um, it is also relates to pandemic. So uh, please, uh, Ms. Kashankova, I kindly ask you um, uh, to um, present your uh, talk around the crown features of translation of actual social political neologisms from German into Russian. So, um, 
My talk is a continuation of the talk of the previous speaker. Uh, we can't but uh, say that the re our reality is linked to a uh, coronavirus pandemic. I uh, focused on um, new semantic neologisms. It is one of the um, ways to amplify the vocabulary of the language. Semantic neologisms are lexis with new associative potential and um, lexis with new characteristics characteristics and new meanings which are ingrained in the consciousness of um, those uh, who have these languages, their mother language. It relates to some uh, terms of specific discourses, uh, economic sports, uh, military and others. These terms are communicatively um, relevant and they function in all in the language in general. It also relates uh, to lexis which already exists, but they uh, gain a new sphere of usage and they gain new meaning. So, as the previous speaker said, uh, lots of these semantic neologisms. Um, so, would lose their relevance and would disappear, but some um, some specialists of translation theory uh, think that some semantic neologisms would become um, some basic notions to um, speak about social change and they would be immaterial witnesses of the epoch. Uh, so, um, this the word COVID coronavirus pandemic um, in German speaking internet was actively used and it was googled more than nine million times. It became the word of the year in the German language, a German as a society of German language recognized it as the word of the year. So we can uh, create, uh, we, we can divide our life in before and after Corona, coronavirus. And I would like to um, uh, address this word Corona. It is the basis uh, for lots of semantic neologisms. Uh, this Lexis had a positive connotation. It was something inspiring. It was excellent, magnificent. It was associated with sun, with victory, um, with well, uh, Toyota Corona or um, some Mexican beer Corona. It is a sun from the bottle. And in Spain, it is the royal family and you specialists from England, remember that there is a small town in the USA, um, which is the lemon capital of the world, according to Americans. But for now, this term has lots of other connotations. It is used in defining the virus itself, uh, the the doctors used this uh, term um, because of the similarity of the virus with the corona and uh, the, the ways of spreading and the um, consequences of spreading it uh, also contain this word uh, corona. Uh, so there are words, semantic neologisms, um, which are uh, compounds, corona plus noun. So um, it is evident that um, new semantic neologisms were uh, terms of medical discourse, but um, social, political, and other discourses 
um, also um, got new words and were like infected by these uh, semantic neologisms and they now are met in almost all spheres of our life. The composition and structure of these semantic neologisms are, is, are transparent, but their um, meaning in the message is not that transparent. We should analyze semantic relations within such uh, lexi lexis. I would like to name the term Hochburg. It is from political discourse. It meant um, a region of a uh, high level of trust of the electorate, uh, of a high uh, number of votes for some party or candidate. And there is a variety of means. Uh, now we need a description to uh, explicate this um, meaning. Um, it is interesting to see some other uh, words which create new meanings. Uh, so some routine term uh, 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 six year, uh, a six months chemical um, haircut and now it refers to um, spread of the pandemic and there is uh, some descriptive translation. So uh, the words mask and the obligation to wear it and uh, they used to mean um, an element of carnival costume and traditions of carnivals costumes in Germany. And now these words are an instrument to fight the pandemic. It um, is used to prevent the spread of infection. So to um, cover this, the message of this semantic neologism, uh, we make some lexical transformations. Uh, we add um, new words. Uh, there is another interesting word, Elbogengegesellschaft. This word was used in the end of the 20th century. It meant um, tough comp competition. It was used to uh, describe modern German society negatively, which is plagued by individualism and which it which neglects others' needs, but now it is acquiring a positive connotation. It is a symbol of an ambitious campaign to overcome the COVID-19 pandemics. It is an indicator of solidarity in society. So we can translate it with an adequate substitution and we um, reshape the meaning of this uh, term uh, and we uh, convey its meaning in uh, modern, modern conditions. And medical discourse has um, given us some uh, terms on sanitary events, sanitary actions uh, to maintain house to preserve it and they also have hygienic uh, shade and there are ideolo ideological and politically motivated events um, to preserve uh, to prevent the pandemic from spreading and we should avoid transcription or calcine. Uh, that is why to, um, to preserve logical uh, adequacy, uh, we can use modulation of um, the original unit. And the last example is the term hotspot. Hot spot. Um, 
it is uh, from technical or advertising discourse because from the technical points of view it is uh, a spot of access and in advertising in marketing it means um, a channel to communicate with the clients. Now this neologism is widely used in German language. Uh, it is linked to migration and it means centers of um, accommodating migrants. It is a very pressing topic to discuss and in modern conditions it is uh, linked to um, the places where the risk to um, infect, be infected with corona is very high. It is some, uh, it is used, some access is omitted, the one with semantical um, irrelevance. So when we translate uh, semantic neologisms into Russian, uh, we should take into attention new associative potential of these words. So to translate this new meaning adequately, uh, we should uh, resort to analysis and use um, methods of uh, Lexis um, explications and descriptions. Uh, we should refer to initial meaning and the um, new meaning. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Ms. Kashenkova, for your talk. So if you have any questions, you can ask them uh, from the mics. I would like uh, to ask a question. It is of practical. So the word lockdown, which um, is now in Russian, it came from English language. And how it is used in German? Um, and what do you, um, how can you translate it into Russian? Uh, so thank you for the question. This term is used in the form you have pronounced it, and the German language is very rich in word combination, word forming, and uh, the German has its own interpretation so Germans um, use adjectives and uh, to make a complex compound and they have a scale a graduation of the events there are long term short term final definitive, strict, non-strict measures, and um, they use it very actively. Thank you. So this question uh, is also to Ms. Bogreva. Maybe she can say something on her research, how this word is uh, used in Russian language is it um, used widely or not and how the meaning of this word uh, do they coincide in Russian and English so lockdown is uh, translated as samoizolatsia or it is uh, trans trans uh, it is trans translated with transcription so the Russian language has lots of borrowings and people who speak English understand this word but if you need translation there is some self-isolation so uh, MEMS is an object of translation well I would also like to think about it but I don't know how um, I got it I managed to do it or not uh, I'm Mm. I, would, I will be attending a workshop on translation of such um, memes. So thank you. If there are any questions, uh, 
And I, I would like to give the floor to the next speaker. It would be a bit different from the previous one. We passed. We're going to consider the event that became a shock to Europe and to the whole world, namely uh, Brexit. This report uh, deals uh, with non-equivalent lexis. Uh, due to this event, uh, a necessity arises to translate the new terms related to Brexit. I would like to tell you about the pragmatic adaptation of these realities in translation. Okay. Here is my presentation. We can start. Let's start with the second slide. First of all, uh, let's uh, talk about what Brexit realities is. I don't want to repeat the text on the slide. These are just some definitions uh, by outstanding linguists researched the realities. And here is a kind of a uh, mixed definition. They also realized that uh, there is no such notion uh, in the language, in other in foreign languages. Of course, Brexit and all the realities related to it are a challenge to us as translators. I underline the key points. And first of all, I want to say that the Lexus related to Brexit is applied in various language situations. Uh, it is used uh, in mass media and in media discourse. Media discourse uh, are the frames uh, which direct our research. And this is what defines our strategy of translation. First of all, let's uh, talk about the classification of Brexit realities. These are neologisms, historical realities, because uh, there are references to the events related to the participation of Great Britain in European Union. And of course, there are metaphors. You can't deal without metaphors because metaphors are an instrument of demonstrating national peculiarities and the national mindset. I will give a couple of uh, the examples of metaphors. Here you see a couple of examples of this uh, slide. Uh, Brexit is a new word for English language as well. And for language system as well. But the word has already been incorporated in Oxford Dictionary and is regarded as general lexis and an element of a British mindset. Because Brexit is already done, solved, as you can see on the slide. Currently, Brexit is already regarded as history. And when we translate, we also use this word in translation. It becomes a part of Russian language as well. And using the word Brexit, we are reflecting national peculiarities of Great Britain. The last example is pretty interesting, Little Englanderism. That's a pretty new term in lang English language. Actually, it is not new. It is just, it is just a reflection of uh, the Brits' uh, position on uh, Brexit. Uh, the next slide, please. Now, I would like to speak about 
And next point about neologisms related to Brexit. The pillars of this sphere are the uh, such words as leave, remain, exit. These are the key components that uh, are laid in the foundation of neologisms. Of course, we understand that media discourse uh, provides a simplified version of certain events and it allows us to use this word in Russian language. But sometimes we need to use descriptive translation because this word should be adapted into Russian language. And in Russian political culture, we, often, we tend to use literary translation. But it is way too early to make our conclusions on the way this verse will be translated into Russian. The next slide is dealing with the reasons for pragmatic adaptation. The first reason is the lack uh, of established equivalence in Russian language. It is worth pointing out uh, that when translating, we should take into account both semantics, uh, that is uh, the notion, and connotation, namely, historical and uh, cultural peculiarities. An adequate translation is keeping the balance between these two components. To overcome semantic asymmetry, we propose uh, adaptation and translation strategies transliteration, transcription, and also interpretative translation, descriptive translation. Of course, new realities require uh, comments and explanation. It is also important to take into account the pragmatic impact um, <clears throat> on their uh, recipient. A right strategy ensures correct uh, message uh, to the recipient. In the beginning, I mentioned uh, that the adaptation of realities is a kind of a local phenomenon. I studied this issue and concluded that the phenomenon of departure is global because the countries mentioned here, namely the words for the countries mentioned here are neologisms in different cultures, not only in British culture. These notions are translated for you to uh, demonstrate that uh, the traditional means of law and translation is not adequate. In my opinion, the best translation tactic is uh, descriptive translation. Uh, some people may say that uh, the uh, the, these variants of translation are occasionalisms, but uh, I believe that the time will show us which uh, variant is the best, uh, because it's way too early to say that these words will become an integral part of Russian language. 
the next slide, please. Well, I would like um, to underscore uh, the word uh, duration model. Brexit is pretty productive. Now I would like to speak about historical realities of Brexit. Uh, here are the most uh, popular realities and uh, words uh, related to Brexit. Without the knowledge of history, in particular the powers of Henry VIII, may be absolutely unclear for the audience. And the culturally significant information reflected in these notions is determined not only by semantics, but by history, language, and cultural potential. And when translating uh, this unit, uh, one needs to provide descriptive translation as well especially in written translation as they help to expand the knowledge of the recipients and are essential for adequate translation. The next slide deals with the conceptualization of the notion of Brexit. There are uh, several discourse topics and the basis of uh, the concept of Brexit. The Lexis related to Brexit uh, may be divided into three categories, but there are also common topics. Brexit is an unprecedented event both for Great Britain and other countries. and Brexit has unpredictable repercussions. These are repercussions are reflected in uh, such um, words as thick Brexit fog leap into the dark uncharted territory. All the countries were shocked with this event uh, due to its uniqueness. The leavers and the remainers had a different approach to the concept of Brexit. Uh, the leavers uh, tried to create a positive image of um, Brexit, while the remainers mentioned uh, numerous risks for Great Britain related to Brexit. Next, I would like uh, to speak about uh, the metaphors related uh, to the special status of Great Britain in Europe. Let's refer to the metaphors and set expressions that uh, characterize the position of Great Britain in Europe. Many of them underline the special uh, status of uh, Great Britain, such as British exceptionalism, for example, and can be regarded uh, as a special feature of the national mindset. You can see other examples on the slide. There are examples of metaphors related to the role of Great Britain in Europe. First of all, these are metaphors uh, uh, reflecting a special role of Great Britain, such as a standoff role. Before translating these metaphors, one needs uh, uh, to study the background. Such metaphors as they can choose approach or you can't uh, have cake and eat it, the best of both worlds. Uh, are also worth noting. Uh, we actually have uh, similar metaphors in Russian language that uh, reflect the impossibility of uh, having everything at once. The Russian equivalent of this expression is uh, you can't sit on two chairs. 
As for the image of Brussels, uh, it is regarded as a convenient whipping boy. And it's pretty similar in la Russian language as well. There are the so-called uh, mechanical metaf metaphors as well. In them, uh, Great Britain is regarded as a balancer or a global center. Actually, these metaphors uh, underline that uh, Great Britain doesn't play any special role, but uh, is simply a component of the European Union. The next point is that there are a lot of uh, sea and marine uh, lexes in English language, and there are a lot of related, a lot of metaphors related to this uh, kind of lexes. There is also there is also a metaphor related to a difficult uh, position of Great Britain. And last point of my presentation uh, deals with uh, the image of Brexit in English language. It was regarded as a difficult process, uh, for example, the long road to Brexit. There were also metaphors uh, related to purchases, such as Brexit as online shopping or to deliver Brexit. Brexit was regarded as a divorce. For example, Brexit is more an invitation than a divorce. And finally, Brexit seemed so difficult that it was compared to surgery. in particular to emergent surgery. Another metaphor is Brexit is like leaving a golf club. Uh, it's a very English metaphor. But there were also metaphors invented by other nations. And here are the conclusions of my presentation. Pragmatic adaptation of uh, Brexit requires a special understanding of the topic. On the one hand, uh, we have the task to preserve the special features of these realities. And if we want to do it by means of transcription and transliteration, uh, it, it may be bad for reflecting uh, semantics and for achieving communicative tasks. On the other hand, we can choose a different strategy, such as loan translation. In this case, uh, we'll preserve semantics, uh, but fail to preserve national peculiarities. Uh, the best strategy for a translator is finding balance between these two strategies and trying to take them into account. Uh, thank you for your attention. If there are any questions, I'm ready to answer them. I have a question. Uh, there is a new verb in English language to Meghan Markle. What's the best way to translate it? By means of maintaining uh, national peculiarities, such as Meghan Markle's or to explain the negative connotation of this verb. If, even the Guardian has already released the recommendation for translation or for interpreting this verb and how to reflect the tense of the semantics. Thank you very much. I think that the translation will uh, depend on the situation. There is no established uh, translation. 
and I think we should take into account pragmatic aspect. It de translation depends on our target audience. And we also should under must understand the stylistics of the text. These are the two key factors of translation. In certain cases, the descriptions and references uh, will be inappropriate in translation. I agree that we should do our best to reflect national peculiarities in translation, but on the other hand, uh, the Russian language doesn't allow, allow for reflecting all the special features of English language. This is why uh, we should uh, try to achieve pragmatic tasks. If there are no questions, uh, I give the floor to the next presenter. This report will deal with uh, the integration speech of Joe Biden. Uh, Irina Solodova will tell us about stylistic devices and means used in the solemn address of the speaker in translation. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Good afternoon, dear participants. Do you hear me? I would like to present the report dealing with the peculiarities of reproducing stylistic devices and means used in the solemn address of the speaker in translation. Our research is based on the integration of speech um, of the, uh, the American President Joe Biden and its translation into Russian. The aim of the study is analyzing uh, the texts uh, and its phonetic, grammatic, and syntactic uh, devices. We aimed to compare the original text and the translated text uh, through linguistics and stylistics. Although the integration uh, speech is presented orally, the text uh, of the speech is presented by the protocol in written form. There are no random words in the integration speech. It is characterized by a number of peculiarities, including on the stylistic level. With that being said, it is especially important to reflect stylistic uh, features of the original text in the translation so that the text uh, preserves its pragmatic potential. As a material of the study, we used uh, the free translation of the integration speech of Joseph uh, Biden into Russian. Uh, not all the translations were of good quality, but first of all, let's uh, take a look onto the statistics. We concluded that uh, syntactic uh, devices were prevalent uh, in the speech. The next slide presents the stylistic devices of the original text. As we can see, the most popular device was anaphora, but other syntactic devices were also widely used. Stylistic effect of, um, <coughs> of a repetition helps to uh, make the speech more powerful. Syntactic devices are not so difficult uh, to translate in most cases. Uh, let's take a look uh, at the variants of translation of syntactic means in the text. The examples prove uh, that it is more or less easy uh, to reflect repetition in the translated text. As I mentioned before, the original text often uses antithesis that helps uh, to make the speech more powerful and to shape a critical look at the past as well as positive insight into the future. 
I would like to present a couple of examples. As you can see, it was pretty easy for the, trans for the translators to uh, show antithesis in the translation. Among phonetic devices, uh, alliteration was the most popular device which was not preserved in the translation. We believe that the translators had uh, to uh, abandon this device uh, because it's easy, it's difficult to uh, find the proper word for translation. However, we believe that theori theoretically uh, preserving alliteration in translation is possible and the materials of the study can be used at translation classes uh, to study um, translation devices. Also would like uh, to take a look at the metaphors. As we know, manipulations are an inherent feature of speeches. And I think um, make the speech more colorful and interesting. The, uh, Biden's inauguration was carried out amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Biden used a lot of uh, morbidic speech. Let's take a look at the following example. A once in a century virus silently stalks the, stalks the country. As you can see, there is a metaphor related to uh, the virus in the example, and virus is compared to a human being. The first translation is as follows. Virus, the second translation. Virus, third translation is also based on the metaphorical concept, but we believe that it is not very adequate because the translator perverts uh, the original semantics. Virus, uh, all in all, it is often uh, easy to uh, translate metaphors into Russian and to achieve the pragmatic effect. This kind of personification was easy to understand for, for the Russians who also faced uh, the virus. At the same time, we see that translators use such translation techniques as uh, semantic shift and concretization. Uh, I would like uh, to provide a couple of conclusions. Uh, the translators often use syntactic devices uh, in the translation. At the same time, the translators often choose not to use alliteration in translation as it requires a lot of time and efforts. In our opinion, all the presented translations uh, were re reflective of the original text. Uh, there may be a couple of reasons for that. First of all, uh, there might be a couple of translators working at it. Uh, secondly, uh, the translators probably uh, had a lack of time to translate that, and this is why uh, they chose not to use all the stylistic devices in translation. The conclusions of our study may be useful for translation classes, and for uh, identifying the most useful translation strategies. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Solodova. If there are any questions, please feel free to ask them. Good afternoon. 
вопрос, который, в общем, изначально возник еще при просмотре программы нашей, да? My question arose when I was studying um, the agenda. In your presentation, you speak about stylistic devices. We saw all of that in your presentation. But I have a kind of a theological question. What's the point of using of reflecting stylistic devices in our translation? As I remember, we were mostly taught to interpret the semantics and the communicative message in the translation. Of course, you mentioned that uh, the translators uh, may ignore stylistic devices, but don't you think that it is related uh, to stylistic asymmetries? Thank you very much for your question. It is indeed interesting and challenging. Actually, all my research career is uh, related to the studies in stylistic devices. In particular, I studied the translation of sonnets of Shakespeare. There are a lot of works on stylistic devices, a lot of works on the translation techniques. Your question is why we should do it. Well, when about literary works, we try to uh, reflect the spirit of the original text. The inauguration speech is, of course, different. It's a different genre. But stylistic devices are used in inauguration speech as well. And we speak about the pragmatic effect of the speech. Uh, we should uh, reflect the stylistic devices in Russian language if we have the opportunity to do so. I understand. We probably uh, had a mis misunderstanding due to a difference in terminology. What I was trying to say is that there are other techniques of uh, reflecting uh, the communicative message of the original text. I agree with you that we should uh, reflect the stylistic peculiarities of the original text and translate it. So I misunderstood you due to a different terminology. Dear colleagues, are there any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Soda, for your report. This topic would remain um, present when other politics come to power, our politicians come to power. So let's move on to next uh, speaker. And we now um, will talk about simultaneous translation, about compression, which is a well-known um, way. So, uh, Ms. Mashutina, please, uh, your talk you prepared with uh, Ms. Marina Korovkina. The floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Our article is about compression and simultaneous translation. Um, this compression is a communication part, so uh, our consciousness uh, tries to economize efforts and resources to convey messages. It is uh, reflected in language. A simultaneous translator uses compression, so is, uh, is it the right of a translator to use compression as a strategy or its usage is imposed by cognitive nature of uh, simultaneous translation. So, um, Gary Chernov understood compression as uh, economizing um, means of language. 
and Lynn Wisson says that compression is um, useful because uh, in simultaneous translation because it is a key skill. Um, we should laconically convey the information, but it should not um, it shouldn't contradict the invariant. So all the uh, parts om omitted can be logically restored. Otherwise, it is a communicative failure. So uh, there are two factors to take into account, the speed of speech and the structural and expressive peculiarities of both languages. Uh, we use um, message compression, translating from English into Russian and uh, translating from Russian into English, we use structural compression. And if uh, the speed is very high, then we use message compression uh, to um, illustrate our research. We use examples of Theresa May and Sergei Lavrov's speeches uh, at the 72nd UN General Assembly. So the translator uh, here united two um, sentences and conf conveyed only the uh, main message. And there is a lexics compression. The word faith is omitted because now it, in this context, it is a synonym of the word confidence and it all implies lexis compression. The next um, extract uh, gives us a, a possibility to see that the word recognize is omitted because it bears no new information. It is both using a message and structural compression. So um, in the second sentence, the, trans the interpreter uh, substitutes all the um, constructions with the word, for example, it is the example of um, message compression and um, this syntax structure is um, is also altered. And in this extract we see structural and message compression. In the sentence one, the interpreter um, uh, and in the second sentence, the interpreter simplifies the structure and transforms it into a simple sentence. It is like a telegraph style. Uh, the translator uses simple, uh, short uh, sentences uh, to follow the high speed of the speaker. In the second sentence, there is also structural compression as the um, interpreter doesn't name the Paris Agreement on Climate Change fully because it is one of the best known, um, uh, best known um, agreements on this subject. And what about compression from Russian to English? Uh, we would like to uh, review um, the extract from Sergei Lavrov's speech. We see structural compression because uh, the um, speed is not very high. And um, Russian, Sadisti Astanavlenu is only one word in English, promoting. So all the um, additional sentences were transformed to a simple one and it um, s simplifies the perception of this text. So there is also a strategy of linear period, this uh, verbalization um, example. So it's unacceptable to interfere. does not accept. So translation is more laconic than the original. These examples um, mostly cover structural compression, message compression, uh, should be revealed through analyzing um, more um, high-speed um, texts um, without having the real text. So in translation, we use structural and message compression. We combine them when there is high speed of speech. And if a trans interpreter cannot follow the speaker, um, it, 
this uh, type of compression is imposed by factors of communicative environment. It is um, a cognitive mechanism together with inferencing and probabilistic forecast. Uh, structural compression is possible when uh, the sentences are transformed or one of the synonyms are omitted. This is a situation imposed at uh, an interpretation strategy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Mashutina. Thanks uh, to Marina Karovkina for the talk. Um, are there any questions on simultaneous translation on compression? And Uh, so there, maybe there are, will be comments from experienced translators. If there are no questions, uh, I would move on to the next talk. Uh, it's the talk by um, Mr. Kalinin. It is about also simultaneous translation. Uh, we would talk about discriminative perception of simultaneous translation. So, Mr. Kalinin, the floor is yours. Uh, my report is related to the two previous ones. And if in <clears throat> different degree, I'll speak uh, about simultaneous translation in television and uh, about simultaneous interpreting in streaming. The material of my study was uh, what my colleague spoke about. This, this was simultaneous interpreting for uh, TV by various channels uh, of the inauguration speech of President Biden. The general material was um, broadcasting uh, of you know, all the events uh, held on that day, but we focused uh, uh, on the simultaneous interpreting of uh, Joe Biden's inauguration speech. Here is a short overview uh, of simultaneous interpreting for TV and streaming. It is believed to be a, a type of audiovisual translation. Most of the researchers consider it a type of um, audiovisual interpreting. Uh, the researcher, Mr. Gambier, uh, identifies uh, four types of audiovisual translation, subtitling, dubbing, interpreting, and voiceover, the most uh, uh, difficult term to translate into Russian. Other classification uh, are also possible, but uh, all of them are uh, the types of audio visual uh, translation. Actually, all of them uh, may be brought into the category of revoicing. Other researchers uh, call it a sound translation. Uh, subtitling is related to captioning of um, a verbal component of the original message. Here is a slide uh, uh, that shows uh, the main <coughs> schemes and scenarios of audiovisual uh, translation in mass media. Uh, as you can see, there are various um, schemes. Uh, Dubbing is uh, pretty rare. It is mainly used in cinema, in fiction TV. While the TV, uh, while TV mainly uses voiceover. With voiceover, we uh, see the background sound. But I'll speak um, about simultaneous 
interpreting. I'll focus on how this type of uh, audiovisual interpreting uh, uh, is, uh, is identified by the recipient. I propose the term media or broadcast interpreting. This phenomenon is not new. Uh, in 1930s, uh, before uh, World War II, a well-known interpreter under Kemmerer and Hans Jacob uh, produced a simultaneous interpreting of the speech uh, by Adolf Hitler for French and British audio. Of course, it wasn't audiovisual interpreting. Uh, it's just an example of a similar type of uh, interpreting. Audiovisual interpreting ever came a bit later. This type of translation has been used for live carriages. Interestingly, uh, interpreting uh, is something uh, media interpreting is something in between uh, simultaneous interpreting and audiovisual interpreting. Of course, uh, simultaneous interpreting has a different audience. At the same time, uh, media interpreting has some similarities with audiovisual interpreting uh, because uh, it is accompanied by video. Here are the spheres of application of media interpreting. I'll just show you this slide and uh, pass to the issues of uh, media interpreting that relate in the foundation of our studies. There are two key types of interpreting on TV and in streaming. The first of them is simultaneous interpreting. When we hear uh, the original sound in the background, uh, an interpretation is, uh, uh, so to say, laid upon the original sound. Another option is preparing uh, a written translation of the original text and then uh, it is read out loud uh, by voice over actors. We are interested in the issue of uh, how the recipient is able to identify media interpreting. We try to identify the challenges and difficulties related to media interpreting. Experiment, we carried out a, a pilot perceptive experiment. Uh, its aim was uh, to acquire uh, comments on the quality of media interpreting. Uh, we had 29 participants. It was pretty difficult uh, to choose the participants because uh, we uh, couldn't invite uh, people dealing with uh, uh, translation. Uh, as a professional interpreter, I can easily uh, see the difference between professional and non-professional interpreting. Uh, we excluded uh, people with linguistic background from our search. Uh, we included uh, participants with scientific, technical, or humanitarian uh, background. Uh, the participants listen uh, to uh, simultaneous to one or two minute simultaneous interpreting, and we also included the so-called distractors into our uh, 
um, experiment. You have two minutes. Uh, our methods uh, were a poll. Uh, and uh, <coughs> uh, collecting comments from our participants. Uh, we found um, six variants of simultaneous interpreting for Russian TV channels. Uh, I won't proliferate and bend you to a time limit. Uh, but believe me, all of these variants of uh, interpreting were pretty different. Uh, we present them to our participants, and as you can see, uh, the percentage of correct identification was pretty high. Uh, it was uh, as much as 72%, but it was not uh, total. Uh, in some cases, the participants um, uh, believe that this uh, is not simultaneous translation as it sounds way too uh, professional. Here are a couple of comments of the informants. Some of them mentioned uh, that there are <coughs> no speakers with uh, such a voice. One participant uh, said uh, that a ma mail does be voiced over by mail. Another participant uh, said that the interpreter uh, didn't provide a very clear interpreting. Uh, probably this participant believed that uh, the interpreter had a speech, had a translation prepared in advance. And uh, the best comment was that uh, the today's translators are so special that you can not understand in certain cases whether they are translating or just reading out loud. Sorry for problems with the presentation. Uh, are there any questions? Yes, I would like to ask a question. I have a terminological question. I'm just interested in your opinion. Uh, to, uh, today, there are a lot of uh, new uh, terms for translation, such as localization, transadaptation, and so on and so on. Uh, many interpreters uh, believe that we're just uh, uh, producing similar terms. They believe uh, that the cognitive uh, specifics of translation remain the same. Uh, do you think that we uh, do need these terms or they are just useless? Thank you very much, Ms. Timko. Uh, thank you very much for your question. Uh, it's a pretty relevant one. But I believe there are two aspects to this issue. The first aspect is that, uh, yeah, there are a lot of new terms such as transcreation, localization. But a different question is whether these are the types of translations or uh, something different. Of course, uh, localization, for, for example, may be a type of uh, translation or, inter or interpreting. Uh, if we need to uh, translate a website, in this case, we work with the linguistic component of the project along with other aspects of it. But in audiovisual uh, translation, the translator is primarily dealing with the linguistic aspect. But localization may be non-linguistic as well. For example, in advertisement. Imagine an advertisement uh, of an automobile. And you see uh, an almost naked uh, girl with amazing makeup. And it looks uh, good in Europe. 
that you need to advertise uh, this car in Saudi Arabia. Of course, it would be difficult uh, to show an advertisement with such a girl there. It is not uh, important what text the advertisement uses. Uh, but in case of localization, um, an image of, of this, an, a visual aspect of this advertisement will be changed. So as you can see, localization may be dealing both with uh, translation and uh, non-translation aspects. Uh, you know, uh, I spoke at another conference today in my alma mater, uh, and there was a researcher who believes uh, that there is translation, and then there is adaptation and uh, other activities. Uh, but I think that uh, this approach is um, irrelevant. This is uh, something similar to what uh, a Russian uh, translation uh, researcher, Komisarov, was speaking about. Identify what translation actually is. And another question, if you allow me, it's a pragmatic question. I'm also working with text and linguistics. And there is a question I often think about. Uh, a question dealing with the intentional Biden. Uh, he uh, sometimes mentions. Uh, the facts uh, that are not relevant for Russia. Uh, do you believe uh, that when translating Biden, uh, we should mitigate uh, his position or uh, completely reflect what he says about Russia? Uh, thank you very much for an interesting question. But I would like to ask you a question in return. Uh, what translation are you speaking about? Are you speaking about the translation of integration speech or something else? What is the situation of translation? Uh, for example, the translation of texts uh, from media sources, the text for television. It's a very general question, you know. Uh, I understand, but it's uh, it's impossible to answer the question because uh, the main point is who you translate for, who your audience is. Перехват радиоголосов вы переводите не для того, для кого предназначен изначальный текст, да? И в этом случае, в общем, вы должны, конечно, ориентироваться на того. Кому вы переводите, да? Я, конечно... I know that some of the interpreters uh, prefer to be more expressive in their translation, and it's uh, dangerous tactics. But of course, uh, there are uh, also uh, the, the etiquette rules. Uh, you probably uh, remember uh, the case with uh, the translation of uh, the term the annexation of Crimea into Russian, which became a scandal. То есть речь идет о том, что параметры коммуникативной и так называемой реальной ситуации, которую вот я тут придумал называть. Question is all about communicative situation. So communicative situation is sort of a framework. 
не менять максимально, быть нейтральными, отзеркаливать это дело. I believe that the best strategy is being uh, neutral and uh, reflect, reflecting the intention of the speaker. Thank you for a valuable question. Thank you very much, Mr. Kalinin. I would also like to add a comment in connection with what uh, Mrs. Timko said about the intention of the speaker. It's a practical question. Uh, we had a translation class. We had a uh, translation of an article from English. Uh, there was an expression such autocrats as Putin in the text. Uh, and uh, the students were confused uh, with how to uh, translate this into Russian. Some of them mentioned that they were uh, recommended not uh, to, uh, to translate it as uh, Avtokrat Putin into Russian. This example shows how difficult uh, it is uh, to keep the balance between etiquette and uh, semantics. Слово автократ, которое на английском autocrat звучит, да, не, не вносит никаких, так сказать, дополнительных, дополнительных смыслов. Вот. Но... Personally, I believe that the word autocrat doesn't have any additional uh, semantical features in Russian, but the students uh, believe that this word should be avoided in translation. As you know, there are other words that can be used for translation. And this case is not unique because uh, there are other uh, words in English which uh, is difficult to translate into Russian with uh, preserving the etiquette rules. But I believe that uh, the translation as autocrat was pretty adequate. I'll answer shortly to your comment. I completely agree with your uh, position. I agree with you that uh, it is worth uh, working out a uniform approach to translating uh, such examples. The example you produced is perfect. As far as I understand, it was translation from, to in, from English, right? Yes, it was an opinion uh, of the American administration concerning Putin. Uh, but didn't you, you think that the word autocrat uh, in, in English uh, means not only authoritarian leader, but also a powerful figure? I think that um, the word autocrat uh, reflects uh, the um, implicit feature of uh, the image of Putin in English. Of course, it would be good to consult the author of the text uh, to understand how to translate it, uh, but uh, the way out of this situation would be analyzing the context. Uh, uh, but I believe that this question is very easy to answer. Uh, if you want uh, to um, show this uh, journalist as a positive figure, uh, then uh, you should uh, change the uh, translation into Russian. But if you want to show him as a uh, negative figure, then you uh, should preserve the word autocrat in Russian. Okay, we now we 
I'll pass the floor to the last speaker for today. If you have any more uh, comments, uh, you can provide them in the, uh, at the end of our section. Ну, наверное, в свете того, что вышел новый стандарт I have I have worked with my student, Ала Иванова. It, it was a work for a competition of scientific works of Rufilms company, which is doing audiovisual translation. My my co-author. My student, Alla, uh, is a disabled person, but not with cognitive disability. So that is why inclusiveness in translation is a close for her. So why are, is our topic pressing? So WHO, World Health Organization, uh, in 2018 declared that in the world there are 39 millions and in Russian uh, over 100,000 people who cannot see, cannot perceive visual information and uh, there are people with some uh, sight uh, problems, but uh, access to information is guaranteed by law and there were amendments uh, to the law of the Russian Federation. So any audiovisual content uh, should um, be adapted to those with poor sight and poor hearing. And we have national standard of TIFLO commenting and um, the terminology does not um, elaborate on the procedure, but the standards of procedure are discussed and there's the website TIFLO.net where it is discussed so in this situation, there are lots of questions um, that there are not a uh, um, unified term or the description, Tifla comment, because there are different methods of it. And one uh, fact, so on April uh, 21st, uh, Minister of, Ministry of Justice registered new professional standard of um, translation profession and there are uh, for the first time audiovisual translator and audiovisual uh, translator for uh, people with special cognitive needs. So those who make subtitles and active for comments and uh, those who translated into simple language. That is why we decided to um, look at the, pro at the problem of TIFO commenting. It means a laconic description of, um, of an object or space which are impossible to understand and perceive uh, by visually challenged people, but there are uh, other points of view, the audio description, it is one of the forms of translation, the form of narrative um, or based on intersemiotic translation with poetic and poetic elements. Uh, it 
was elaborated by Mr. Barshevsky, who is dealing with such uh, problems of translation. So I was uh, taught uh, in the audiovisual translation school in Rufio's company, and he was my professor. And there are some methods uh, of audio description of films, audio descriptions of pictures, audio description of guided tours, and there are some um, arts that have not been touched yet. For example, performance. Performance is not my cup of tea, it was uh, the, um, the choice of my student who loves Marina Abramovich, her performances, is, it's uh, the um, art not for all, and 45% of our students know about uh, performance and 25% doesn't know and would like to know and 37.5% uh, said that they're interested in new things in art and how important is performance in our lives. Um, uh, there is a picture from the um, from uh, any from a cartoon uh, New Year email, so some mouse had a performance to justify his conduct. So that is why we should um, get visually changed people acquainted with performance. Performance is a new um, a phenomenon in art. It is a multi-level process. Uh, fiction, um, it uh, subverts stereotypes, its ideas in interpretation, it is sometimes an improvisation, there is only the general idea, it's an improvisation of the artist and of the spectators. Uh, for example, the performances of Marina Abramovich, uh, She's a Serbian, she's a grandmother of performance, and there are some of her performances which had huge resonance. They are sometimes difficult to perceive and understand. And she experiments a, a lot with her body as well, and we decided to take the most simple uh, performance uh, it is uh, in the color pitch in the center. It is a performance, the presence of an artist. It, it consisted in the artist sitting and establishing visual contact with people who sit opposite her. And there were some interesting cases, some uh, spectators set uh, some 10 hours and one time there were her ex-partner, her ex-lover, and she reacted in another way. Uh, so we are focused on the video in the internet and we described the three minute video. So how to uh, describe the situation, it is very difficult. So uh, how should we analyze the performance? There is a cultology uh, thesis uh, about perceiving performances. So it's perception has three levels, social perception and group perception and individual perception. So our cultural factors and social perception 
is shaped by cultural, political, and religious factors. Uh, uh, group perception is an intermediary level, and uh, the inner level is uh, the interpretation of the conduct based on our experience. So we have come to the conclusion that we should only not only describe the picture um, of uh, in the video in YouTube, but also we should tell about the social context of the situation. Uh, so having analyzed the material of Ivan Borshevsky, uh, where he recommended to make pre-translation analysis. Uh, we added some our points and we uh, created the strategy of pre-translation analysis of the performance. It uh, helps us understand uh, it better, which information we should uh, use when creating the scenario of audio description. We had an experimental research. There was the first variant of audio description, which uh, did not take into account cultural context. Um, and there was also material which did not refer uh, to the video, but uh, to the situation itself. It was, we followed the instructions of TIFLA commentaries. Uh, we contacted Margarita Melnikova. She is an expert of Fru Films company, and she uh, is responsible for quality of photo description. She is blind, and she. Uh, reads with special uh, means. Mm. And uh, she uh, tells about her um, uh, impression of audio descriptions. And there is a site for visually challenged people, which is called Describe to Me. There is also um, Another description, which um, which included cultural context of this performance, um, and the uh, comment uh, she um, made is so the meaning of uh, so the artist re reacts differently to other people. Uh, but uh, she did not catch the meaning of the performance and her uh, description uh, too was more uh, as a false. It is more interesting, more understandable. And when we elaborate an audio description of performance, uh, we should not only describe what is happening, but the social context. And in this vein, uh, audio description is uh, closer to art, uh, science. Um, uh, so this is our topic. It is very complicated. It is a new one. It is extraordinary, but it refers to translation sphere standards. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Belozorsova. Are there any questions? Well, now we can, if some have uh, some other questions and comments, we can, uh, discuss them um, during five minutes and next session uh, will um, 
be at five o'clock for those willing to participate who has inscribed uh, to participate in round tables and workshops and uh, uh, before this time you will be free so if you um, so summing up our discussion I would like those willing to make some comments which you uh, consider relevant uh, on these issues on translation theory uh, and translation new conditions. So please, if you have something to say, please. May I say, yeah, thanks. I would like to uh, express my appreciation of the last talk. I think that all the other I issues have been discussed for decades, uh, lots of these issues, but this um, report uh, or films on our company and Alexei Kozolev, who is promoting audiovisual translation. Um, and I guess that it is uh, something new. Well, maybe it seems like uh, something around translation, but in global understanding uh, the ability to hear each other. Uh, so the translation from human to human is the most important translation. Thank you. I uh, support. I'm here, so uh, I'm glad that uh, there are new programs, TFLO Translate, and there are graduates. I have a graduate, master's graduate, uh, who is a TFLO translator. So I'm, I'm, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, not Miss Timko. Well, your report was also a very important one. And this uh, topic uh, deserves uh, further elaboration because it um, it has a huge potential. So, are there any commentaries on uh, on the topics which we have not covered in your in our talks? Uh, so, if there are no questions, I would like to thank all the participants of this discussion uh, for your. Uh, for your active participation and for your interesting talks. So, new uh, circumstances, we uh, face new realities and the um, translation strategy choice is very important. We have uh, the same problems as translators before us, uh, but now some circumstances have changed and uh, we should take them into account. I thank all the participants because every talk had mm, lots of interesting and uh, reasonable things. So thanks to all of you. I will be waiting you uh, tomorrow um, at 11.30, so 11.30, at 11.30 we will begin, so see you tomorrow, um, we wish you a good evening, good continuation of the conference, and we wish you to continue fruitful cooperation, thank you, that's all for now. Thank you, dear colleagues. Uh, thank you, um, Miss Moderator. Your work was great. Thank you. So that's all for now. You can disconnect. So see you tomorrow.